Yeah. Uh, yeah. I can do it. So, uh, yeah, good afternoon. I'm Adam. Um, for those who I haven't met yet, uh, today we're really talking very quickly about uh, turning the mess on the on the left hand side of the screen, which I'm sure looks familiar to a lot of you. Uh, turning your piles of, of dusty, dirty treasures into something a little more digital uh, and portable. So I'm the first part of the presentation, I'm just going to speak very quickly uh, about you know, what digitizing is and what some of the benefits are. And then I'm going to pass it off to Mike, who's actually going to be talking uh, and discussing a, a, a program called Vinyl Studio, uh, which works very well in digitizing your records. So what are we talking about here? Well, we're talking about converting analog uh, signals to, uh, to a digital signal here. And you're probably all familiar, you know, most of you have used computers. So what we're really talking about is you know, taking those analog signals and converting them into digital files, the same way that you would digitize, uh, or, or the same way that you would have Word documents or pictures. Uh, it's the same sort of thing. We're creating digital files that typically you store on some sort of device, whether it be on your computer, uh, could be a, a proprietary format that only works on some uh, devices, such as an iPod. Uh, but that's what we're talking about here, is uh, turning uh, your sounds into these uh, files. And so what are some of the advantages? Why would you want to do it? Well, when we get to Mike's portion, he's going to talk about how uh, you're going to be able to listen to your music cleaned up in, in ways that you've never heard it before. Uh, but there's a lot of practicality involved with digitizing your, your music as well. Uh, we've come a long way from uh, this picture of my Birch Portable, uh, which you would, uh, in the old days, would allow you to, you know, have one record at a time. Um, it takes up space. Um, as they sort of moved into sort of the digitized format, uh, you know, it got to, uh, for example, the CD player, the CD, uh, CD ROM. So from a portable point of view, uh, we went from the Birch with one machine to a smaller CD player, but you were still limited to the uh, amount of data that you could carry on it. So typically one album uh, on a CD. So we've gone from you know, that first picture with the shelves and shelves of, of records to you know, less constricting, less space uh, constricting in the CD, but it still takes up a lot of time. Um, and then, you know, as technology advanced a little bit, now we're at the point where we have devices like the iPod, which allows us to carry tens of thousands of songs uh, portable in, in, a, in a device this size as well. So there's a lot of convenience that comes with it. And as I mentioned, typically, uh, you know, these sort of digital files are things that you would download and store on your machine. But there's a new technology, or relatively new technology, which is streaming audio. And this allows you to listen to music without having to download uh, these files yourself. Um, and, and you're basically using somebody else's collection, per se, and then you're paying a user fee on a monthly basis in order for that privilege. And I had the discussion with my daughter, especially sometimes, it's like, Dad, why would you want all those records? And why would you want those CDs? It's like, I don't want anything to do with CDs now. And, um, from their perspective, Gen X, it makes a lot more sense to just, it's like having a cable subscription, you just subscribe to a music provider and it gives you everything so long as you're online and you don't use up all your data. Yes, um, and you know, so that's the one side where, uh, you know, you're, uh, some people may feel that you're sort of restricted in paying for music that's not your own. Um, then the flip side is, hey, if I have these formats, uh, you know, I own them and they're mine sort of in perpetuity. Um, but when you go also the subscription uh, route as well, you have to uh, take into consideration that you are now going to have access to tens of thousands of songs that is not in your collection. Uh, one thing that Mike mentioned as well um, is you need an internet connection. However, some of these subscription services today, like Spotify, <coughs> Pandora, as long as you have that subscription, you can download them and hold them on your device, and as long as your subscription is active, you can still listen to it. So, for example, if you're listening to it on the subway on the way to work, if your internet goes out, you can still listen to it. And actually, I found, um, I get, my daughter gave me Spotify for free, so I got it on the phone, I'm going to use it. And I found, I was able to take the song that I wanted off Spotify, <coughs> run it through this program, Vinyl Studio, made a digital copy of it. Now, I've got a permanent copy of it in my digital file, whereas if she decides to cancel her subscription, 
Um, my daughter won't have that material anymore, but I picked what I wanted, so now I've got a permanent copy of it. So that'll be another advantage of having this final studio program. Is that legal? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, was it illegal when you borrowed someone's record and you made a cassette copy of it? Yeah. With his permission. Yeah. And you got permission for every record you borrowed? Well, you agree, you sell it. I don't know. Yeah. I look at it that my daughter's paying for this service and I'm not selling the product and I'm just keeping it for myself. The same way as if I made a copy of one of these 78s. It's the same thing. But I'm just mentioning that, that with Vinyl Studio, they probably haven't figured out that you're able to do this, like Spotify would, but it's just another little advantage of it. And I wanted to suggest, too, Adam's got a picture of an iPod Classic up there. And I know, Adam, you've got a 160 gigabyte. How many songs do you roughly have on yours? Uh, I think right now I have about 17,000, but I still have a lot of space available on it. I think I have like another 30, 30 gig is still available on it. So something so, that's smaller than a pack of cigarettes is holding 17,000 songs, and you've got more room on it. With more room, yeah. yeah. So, you know, very convenient. What's the quality like, though? Is it like lousy MP3, or is it good, you know, uh, you compared know, it's, to what you could buy on a CD? Or? I've, you know, depending on, you know, the source of where I got them, but for the most part, uh, it's all fine. I, you know, very rarely have I had any issue with it. One quick question, by the way. You listed a bunch of formats, and I didn't see FLAC. Uh, I get asked for flack a lot. Well, <laughs> which I, I get a lot of flack if I don't yeah. have flack. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and I was sort of talking about proprietary software, and you know, not all devices will support uh, sort of all formats. So flack, I believe, is you know a much higher quality, bigger size files. Yeah, so it just takes up a lot more room. I've, I've it does, got, but if somebody wants a CD compilation from me, I would, and they say they want it in flack, I say good. It's going to take all night to upload it, but yeah, here it is. Yeah. <laughs> Let me know when you got it so I can take it out. <laughs> okay. Um, so this slide, preserving history, it's actually sort of two things. Uh, one, we're talking about uh, you know preserving your and our collections. You know, one, we know that uh, our records and the devices that we put them on are fragile. And you know, as I found out last week when I. When a Guy Lombardo uh, record just fell out of a, an album that I had where the sleeves just disintegrated, it fell, it broke, that was it. As well, um, you know, the vast majority of people uh, outside of this room, when one of their machines break, they're kind of screwed, right? <coughs> and so there's a fragility to both the mediums that we, we capture and hold the music on as well as the machines themselves. Uh, once you digitize them as well, you know, if you're listening to that digital, uh, the digital version, there's no sort of degradation or wearing, further wearing out of the actual records themselves. And then finally, um, you know, if you do drop the record and break it the way that I did, uh, or if you back up all of your machine, uh, all of your collection, you know, if a, if a catastrophe hits, if a fire occurs, you know, or when the time comes, which has sort of become a euphemism uh, around here, uh, you can still have access to all of your, uh, your records. So that's what we're sort of talking about there for preserving. But I also just want to mention a couple of sites which you, you may or may not be available, but through the uh, technology, and you know, I, I talked to, on the previous slide about streaming, um, as, with an internet connection, you have at your fingertips uh, just a huge amount of resources available to you to hear uh, music for free and information for free. Uh, there's the National Jukebox from the Library of Congress. Um, you know, if you just go there and it just streams through your browser, you can go on to YouTube. You know, I know we're primarily talking about audio here, but with YouTube, you can get the audio and video with it. Um, Tweet uh, Project 78, I think it's the, the Great 78 Project, I'm sorry, uh, more resources, you know, they'll tweet out, you know, here's a song, so sort of almost like a song of the day. And finally, I'll, I'll often put a uh, radio, I think it's Dismuke, yeah. uh, I often have it uh, streaming in my background here, it's like 1925 to 1935 music. Uh, and as well, with these information, with these sites, not only, you know, do you have it at your fingertips to hear these songs, but you also have access to so much of the information that corresponds to it, you know, with the artist, when was it released. So, um, I just sort of want to mention those that, you know, if you haven't heard of them before. Yes? How would you digitize a cylinder machine? Is there any electronic pickups? 
I'll let Mike handle that. <laughs> um, actually, I bought a kit a couple of years ago, and it's quite good. It's a guy, he sort of like making, found it on eBay, and it comes with one cartridge and three styli for brown wax, two minute, and four minute. And you just um, take the reproducer out of your cylinder machine and pop this in. There's um, just some RCA connectors going to it. And now you've got sound going through your stereo system, which would also work on Vinyl Studio too. I didn't do any for this presentation, but it is doable. So, you know, before uh, we hand it off to Mike, um, you know, if you're like me, competitive, uh, you know, you're right now you're sitting here thinking, I, after this comprehensive look at digital, you now know everything there is to know about you know digital music and technology. And right now you're thinking which one is better for you. Um, and I think if we look at the formats, you know, pretty clear-headedly, you know, if we consider uh, the improved sound of digital, uh, the convenience of being able to you know carry thousands of songs uh, you know with you at any given time. Uh, the ability, you know, through digital uh, streaming sites like um, Library of Congress, National Jukebox, and you know the convenience of sort of being going out with your your loved one, <coughs> and you compare that to things like, uh, you know, um, Caps member Jeremy Hopkin, who on a hot day gets to drag his portable out and maybe a couple of records with him. Uh, the fragility of, as I mentioned, of the records and, uh, you know, the mediums themselves. That's not your Nyla Marlowe record. <laughs> no, no. I wish it looked that good after I dropped it. Um, you know, if you want to drag your, I think it's a, what is it, Bill? A C-250 was your postcard. I think, you know, if you want to drag it so you and another couple can dance in the field, you know, be careful you don't snap the feet off of it. Uh, if you want, you know, to take up spaces and space, you know, tons of space within your place, it's clear then when you consider all of these, which is the better format, and the answer is clearly both. And with that, I hand it over to Mike. Thank you very much, Adam. So the point you're trying to make is, it's great to still have the original machines, and also to be able to digitalize your collection. Okay, have it on the go. And that's the last slide. Oh, okay, so we've talked about a lot of this already, why digitalize. Uh, preserving your records makes it easier to download your collection. And I've talked to a few of our members here who've sold off their collections, and they have managed to keep a digital copy of it, so they don't have the bulk. Maybe they're moving, selling the house, moving to a condo, uh, but they're still able to listen to the records. I'd like to point out that with uh, services like Spotify, yes, they offer so many songs on there, but I'll bet you everybody here has got one or two records that they don't have on there. I like to try to challenge it sometime. And they might have some Cal Stewart on there, but they don't have them all. So it's always nice to have your own copy of the record too. And I'm hoping to show you as we go through the presentation, you'll be able to improve the sound of your collection when you convert it over by the, the program that we're about to walk you through. Um, so, in order to get started in digitalizing, um, it, I think it's safe to say you're going to have to have computer skills, just basic skills. And I don't consider myself any kind of computer expert. I know Adam's a lot better with the computer than I am. But just playing with the program and walking my way through it and being determined to figure it out and make it work, I was able to do it. So I figured if I'm able to do it, probably most people can. Um, you're going to need something to play the finished product on. Adam showed iPods, your phone I'm sure can do it, there's MP3 players, there's a variety of devices out there that will play them, and you're going to need a program, something like iTunes and or Windows Media, in order to organize them and make playlists and keep uh, all the converted files together. You'll need a turntable to play the records, which of course goes without saying, but you're going to see, uh, I'll show you an example, the turntable doesn't have to have 78 on it. This program's got a feature where you can play it at 45 and then it up converts the speed later. And was, as I was playing with it, I found there's also other ways you can um, change the speed. So for instance, if you play an 80 RPM Columbia or an Edison disc or something like that, you can type in 80 and you're playing it at, say, 78 or 45, the program will up the speed to get the proper pitch for you. If you're doing cassettes, you'll require a cassette deck to play it back. And I did a cassette for Adam, you had a family Mm -hmm. cassette, and you were uh, quite happy with the results. It was fantastic. It was, uh, my girlfriend had a cassette, which I think was transferred from a reel-to-reel -reel like 40 odd years ago. Um, gave it to Mike, Mike digitized it, and it was fantastic. It gave her an opportunity to listen to 
Uh, her father yeah. has like a six-year-old. Her mm -hmm. aunt, who passed away years ago, gave her a chance to listen to her uh, grandparents, who she never really met. Uh, so it really was uh, you know, just sort of a, a great opportunity and kind of a neat experience. So what we're trying to say in the slide is that you're going to need some hardware, and uh, we'll try to walk you through a bit of what, how you'll hook it up and whatever. So you're going to need some kind of a, a USB device. So this is something to convert the analog signal to something that the computer can accept. I'm showing the little preamp that I have here, and I think you bought this one too, right? Mm -hmm. um, just got it off of Amazon. It's now around $79. The beauty about this one that I like is you can see it's got a gain control here, so you can adjust the volume going into the computer, and I found that that helped to reduce the distortion. I had another preamp where you couldn't adjust the volume, and you would adjust the, the input signal on the computer, and I was getting distortion. Um, I like this one too because it's also got line in, so if you want to play a cassette deck as opposed to a turntable, it accepts it. And then the output just goes right into the USB connection on the computer. It's just a tiny little box, and. Uh, there's many others out there too, um, but so you'll need some kind of photo preamp. I did tap into the output on my amplifier. It was a uh, Kenwood amp. So I plugged the turntable into the receiver and then took the output. And using the device I had that could not adjust the volume, I was getting distortion. So I found this was the best way to go. And you'll need some kind of program. I want to say. We've picked Vinyl Studio, we found it user friendly, there's many more programs out there. There's also others that are free such as Audacity, I guess this, a lot of you heard of Audacity before, you've used it? Yeah. Um, I played with it, it's, Audacity's a good program and I just found it wasn't as user friendly for me, that was just my feel of it and I found I was hopping around all over the place and you'll see with Vinyl Studio Basically, everything you want is right there, so it was just my preference for it. Did you want to make a comment about Audacity? Okay. No? Okay. Uh, that? Is there a cost to the Vinyl Studio? Yes, there is, and what a great segue for the next slide. So, Vinyl <laughs> Studio, uh, when I purchased it, I think about two years ago, it's $30 US, and now they've gotten smart, so now they're making a basic version and a pro version, and the pro version is fifty dollars. And if you have the original one, I think it's another twenty-five dollars US or something like that. Um, I'm not sure what you get in the pro version, and I was praying to God that they would not cut off this version of my program before this presentation, because the last thing I wanted to do was to have to learn a new version of the program just before showing it to you. So, fingers crossed, they haven't done it. Um, I think with the pro version now. Uh, the equalization settings for different 78s is in there, so I think they're no longer giving it in the basic one, but I'll find out in a month or two when they force me to upgrade. And I'm just going to walk you through the program and show you some before and after examples. And one neat thing about the program that I like is that the original recording is always there. So if you change your mind and you know, oh, I, I cut the treble down too much in this, or there's too much bass, or you know, I didn't get that click or something like that, you can always go back to the original and do it again. So it's always there. It's not like you have to re-record the record, which is a beauty about it. It takes up a little more space to do that, but you've always got what they call the WAV files, which is like CD quality, and so you can always retouch it at a later date. And they push that as one of the benefits of it. So hookup, we talked about a lot of this. You basically plug the turntable into something like the USB preamp that I showed, and then the preamp goes into the laptop. And then we, um, I'm gonna walk you through these uh, particular fields. To save time, it would've been pretty boring if I brought a turntable here, and I play the record, and have you listen to it, yeah, the record's playing, and then I sh now show you the program. So what I've done is I've just recorded records into the program, but I'll tell you how I got to that part, and then I'll walk you through and how we do um, the cleanup of the sound and how we organize them. And Mike will now walk you through Vinyl Studio. Is there anything else? Um, oh, I wanted to talk about recording equalization before we start. So when a record's <coughs> cut, they, uh, they, when a record is made, they cut the bass frequencies and they boost the treble. Why is that done? Anybody want to guess? David, help me out. So they can get more on the disc because the grooves can be closer together. Right, because the groove but would modulate too much. But it has to be compensated for in playback. Right, so with a lot of bass, the groove would modulate too much. So it's going to take up more space and or go into the next groove. And why do you think they boost the treble? 
So we could pay more? Uh, I don't think if they charge a price. I'm just kidding. Yeah, I've lost. I've lost. Tweeters. I've, <laughs> so if you think if they, okay, so they're reducing the base when they cut the record, and then they're increasing the treble. So then when they play it back, they're going to do the reverse. So if you're reducing the treble, you're going to reduce the surface noise. Because they were pressing up garbage. <laughs> yeah. Could be. Could be. Forty-five <laughs> in the fifties into the sixties. Yes. Yeah. They also um, had to be able to be played on a sea breeze. That would be the wear test. Yeah. If it played a sea breeze, yeah. they would release it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Seriously. David knows these things. Um, so the point I'm bringing this up is that prior to 1954, they didn't have standardized curves. So everything after 54, they use the RIAA setting, the Recording Indus Association of America. So they set particular frequencies in which they're boost and cut. And so this shows on this slide here, the blue in recording, they've reduced the bass and they've increased the treble. And then when they play it back, they do the exact opposite in red. So now they're going to increase the bass and reduce the treble. So it's important at what frequencies the boosting and the cutting is done. And we'll see that, say in the 1920s, Every company did their own thing, and a, a Victor record was different than a Brunswick, which was different than whatever. So we have to compensate for that when we play the record back on modern equipment. If you just play it back with the RIAA setting, you're going to get usually a booming record that's kind of dull. There's not a lot of treble. And I'm going to try to show you an example of a, a 1938-78 played with RIAA and then played properly with the right uh, equalization. So I'm just bringing that up now because we're going to get to it in the presentation. So that's it for there. And now I'll take you into the presentation, into the program. So this is the first screen of the program. And it starts you off with, what do you want to do? Do you want to record or import a new album? Or do you want to work with a previous album? So we're going to pretend we're going to make a new album here. So I'm going to click on record or import a new album. And I'm going to create the album. So we have to give it a name. Let's call it Caps. Yes. Oh, to Bill. And you can put the release date if you know it. You can set your genres. Anybody know what a genre is? Blues, country. Blues, country, jazz. types of music. Category. Yeah. A category. Um, for instance, um, I've been doing some records lately for Christmas. So I have a Christmas category. So that I can just select a genre on my playback and it's going to play all the Christmas records. Um, I'll break them down according to the 1920s and swing and stuff like that. You can put the label and the label number. Decide is, is this a single or an album? And you can mix it down to mono. So you select all these things as you go along. I'm going to pretend to create an album. Yes? There's something very interesting. You can actually look it up on Discogs. I'm going to get to that actually. Oh, but thank you. Do you have the program? No, I was. Oh, okay. Just You're just being very astute. Thank you. Um, and I'll show, I'm, I'm going to show us looking one up. So I've now created the album, which is this one here. And then what I would do is I can check my levels. And, and I don't know what's playing here. You? You are. Uh, yes, probably I'm getting feedback. OK, I had that problem before. Let me turn the volume down. I'm getting that because I don't have the phono preamp plugged in. Um, so this is where we would set our levels. You can see it's picking up the microphone as I talk here. And here's our volume. But we leave the volume on two or three, and I adjust it with the preamp. Here, for now, I'm just going to leave it as copy of RIAA. So we're going to pretend we're doing a newer recording. And here's the frequencies for the bass are boosted at 500 hertz, and they're cut off at 10K. So you can show it as hertz. Of, David, what's US? Show us U.S. I think yeah, it's I like know, in English. English. <laughs> You've never seen that before? Okay. I remember when they were cycles per second, which then yeah, it which is now it's hertz. So. Um, I should point out this is a British program, so there's a few little British things in there, and I think U.S. whatever that is is microseconds. Micro maybe. maybe. Stand for microsecond. Mm. Oh, could be. Yeah. But I show it as hertz because it's more understandable. So I would adjust my volume here. I turn the preamp up and down. I can listen to the record being played. And so, again, to save time, I've played records into the program. So what I would do next is, now that my record's being played, I would be in the one that I'm in. But I'm going to select one that I previously put in here. And so 
these are like, these gives you an idea of how many records I've been converting in this program. So like there could be albums in there or, I, I separate my 78s but put 78 in front of them. So the first one I'm going to do for you is a 45 from 1971 called Joy by Apollo 100. And this is what the 45 looks like in a waveform. So we can play it here. <coughs> Not much surface noise. This one's in pretty good shape. to tell the computer when to start and stop this track. So it's arbitrarily <coughs> put in just when I drop the needle. So what I want to do is move this start to over here in the beginning. You can see it just starts there and I'll play it back a bit. Okay. So that's, we want it to start there instead of hearing the needle drop on the record and hear surface noise. And then after the record finished here, <coughs> I want to stop it about there. So I'll move my end marker there. So now I've got this track marked for starting and stopping. It sounds nice and clean as they play on the iPod. Um, so I'm dealing with a modern recording, so there's not as much work to do on it. Now I've gone to the tab, clean up audio. This one's kind of neat, but on a 45, a clean 45 like this, there isn't that much to clean up. So this is where we would go to do our noise and pop filters. So for sensitivity, I find usually having it on one is more than plenty. Um, and there's something called percussion protection. This is like if someone hits a drum. The problem is the computer's got to separate a drum from a click or a pop. So they have something called percussion protection. And if you put it to maximum, you normally would use that on good recordings. It won't affect the sharpness of the thwack of the drum. So we normally just leave it on maximum. We'll see later on when we do acoustic 70 inch, you're going to take it off altogether. And there's something called brass protection, which just keeps the horn sounding nice and crisp and clear on a good recording. Um, this record's in good shape. I'm only going to do one pass of it. So we're going to scan the entire file. Watch how fast this is. It's scanning for clicks and pops. It found 1,041. Yeah. Which sounds like a lot, but wait till we get to the old stuff. It's ignored 144 due to uh, percussion protection, and it's ignored 11 due to brass protection. So here, if you see this part here, the black is the, the surface noise at the beginning of the record. I can play it now. The thump is just the needle going in the groove, and there's no surface noise there. No. Now, this is not a, best, a good example for surface noise. And what I can do here is take off the filtering. So it's removed that crackle there. But we're going to give you some good examples of noise reduction coming up soon. Um, other things you can do is that we would not do on a new, a good recording. There's a rumble filter, there's a hum filter. The hiss filter is good. I'll be showing you that with 78s. I would not use a hiss filter on this record. It's, there's nothing wrong with it. You've got a graphic equalizer. Again, I would not adjust that. But what you might want to do is adjust something they call normalization. It's the volume. Do you ever know some records are louder than others? <coughs> some blast really loud, and some are very quiet. So this get, lets you just basically play the recording. And I normally have it in the 50s. I keep them all around 50, 55. And if it's not loud enough, I can increase the volume here. So it's around 54, 58. This one's probably OK. And I leave it at that. Stop it. And that's the end of digitalizing this particular song. The one, the one next thing I would do is, I'm going to go into burn CDs. I'm going to click it off here. Oh, it looks different now. Hmm, not used to it. Normally what I would do is click it off, click on it, and then it's going to convert it to an MP3. 
I was just doing this yesterday, and now it's different. Oh, I know, I'm in the wrong one. I'm in batch. So what I do next is I'm going to check this off. It says, before you can play your tracks or copy them to an external player, you need to save them. So what we're going to do is save it. I'm saving them as MP3s. And save tracks. It gives me options. So I can save it as an MP3 format. And David, you were asking about FLAC. So this has FLAC. It's got AIFF. I think that's a... Somebody Apple sent me something in AIFF, and I'd never heard of it before. It's an Apple program. Apple. Apple and yeah. I could not convert it. I wanted to transfer it to a CD, and I thought, how oh, the hell would I don't just play it real time, <laughs> analog, and I ran it onto a CD. Then you did it like that. Rather than screw around for a half yeah. hour trying to deal with it. So my Didn't point lose is anything. <laughs> my point is this program's got all different formats you can stick it in. I've just selected MP3s. Um, because that's what my playback equipment uses. And then there's options for MP3s, so how good a quality you want. I go with the highest quality, but if you want, you can see there's all, all you can go to some really crappy settings here if you wanted to. Um, so I just keep it at the best. And then I would go OK, and it converts it to an MP3. Actually, I'll do that one, see how fast it is. It's making it an MP3, and it's going to set a file for it in the computer. And then I would just pop that into my um, iPod or whatever I've got. Okay, it saved it, and it's done. So that's it. So that is tra that is playing a record, um, marking the tracks on the computer, and then I'm cleaning up the sound a little bit on this, and now we've made it into an MP3, which can be played on Adam's iPod or your phone or whatever. Uh, any questions about this so far? Can you, can you do it with CDs as well? You've got a CD, CD that's got some scratches and skips and that, or is it not that advanced? Well, the scratches you get on a CD might cause it to skip, yeah. but it's not going to cause surface noise, right? So there actually is a part in here. I haven't used this. You can import sound files, which I believe... Oh, we want to import... Give me a sec. Sorry. So I'm going to pretend I'm making a new album, and I would import a sound file. So I believe you can play the CD into this and, and so have it in Vital Studio and now I can edit it and do things like that. So I think you can, but I've never used it. Can you know. increase the volume without use for a previously recorded digital file? Can you increase the, the, the playback volume? Like if, if you've recorded something live that's got really low volume. Okay, I you, think I know what you're saying. Where you would do that is in your cleanup audio, and you'd go to your equalizer, and you can adjust these. This, this is your output. What does it say? I, I leave these um, helpful bullets on here. It's like when I touch it. Adjust these sliders so that the indicators on the right enter the red zone. So it's basically telling you you can adjust the volume. So if you had it in the program, you can adjust it. David? When you're using normalize, is that for the entire program that you want to preserve, or is it for individual tracks? Great question. Because... Because... Because when I was doing CD <laughs> compilations for Intersound, they would hit normalize, and it would be a Benny Goodman compilation, and there'd be a trio cut next to a full band, and the trio cut would be boosted up to here. Oh. And I go, <laughs> the trio cut should have played at minus five. <laughs> So my understanding is you can, I, I normalize each individual recording. So normalize is another word for vo automatic volume control. In the jukebox, it's they had automatic volume control, and you just set this, and it raises or lowers the volume according to the record. So normalize is the new term for it. You just keep them all at the same level. So you can do them one by one, and I've seen it in the program. There's another place where you can just normalize the whole batch of them at once. Which is okay if they have the same basic if sound. If you've got, yeah. But if you've got a much more intimate recording as part of the mix, and that's you why want it down. I was fine when I hit normalize. It would work a lot of times, but not all the time. So I manually adjust each recording. It takes a little bit more, but whatever. So I'd like to move on quickly to the next thing. So I'm, I'm working you through the program, and I'm trying to show you some of the features of it. And I think you'll appreciate it more as we get into more crappy recordings. I forgot to show you one feature. Now, I'm going to get the sound up here again. Um, oh, no, it's not here. When I go to record, 
Oh, no, it's here. There's a neat feature, wafer needle down. So what you can do is, think about it. I got the record spinning. I've got this ready to go. I hit record on the computer. I drop the needle. The computer won't start recording until it hears the needle go thum. So it saves you a little bit of space. And at the end of the record, suppose you go off and do something else, <coughs> the needle lifts off at the end. It will lift the needle up. So here I've got it. It'll record 12 seconds after the needle goes up. So it's just helping you do a lot of things where you don't have to be around to babysit this program. It's a neat little feature. Um, and here's our speed conversion. We'll get to that. But I'd like to show you another record now. You never thought you'd be hearing Pink Floyd at a CAPS meeting. I copied the record. This is actually off a of quadraphonic record, so it's a little different than the stereo version. So this is what the entire album, both sides, looked like. And you can see, what's the name of our track? I don't know. I'd, I can manually type in each track. Or what I can do is I can look up the track listing. So it's not going to find two CAPS Pink Floyd. If I take out the CAPS part, we can go online and look up Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon. There's too many albums, so they found a ton of them. So what it's giving me is the song listings and the time. See down here? Here's all the cuts on that album. And I like this part too. You can download a picture of the album. So I'm going to import the album art. And I'm going to use the selected listing. So now, Here's all the titles of the songs. I didn't have to type them all in. And why is it when you're doing a demonstration, things don't work right? It's supposed to put all the track breaks in here, and it didn't. I guess I should have practiced this more at home. Normally, it would put a green and a red and show each track. And it just saves you from doing it manually. This is one track. Yeah, it's this, oh, this you're is right. one, this is That's one side. Yeah. One. So breathe is the next track. Yeah, that's it. So it's showing the whole thing. What you do look up there is an option not only for Discogs. It looked like there was some... Oh, there's, yeah. If you want, you can go to... I find Discogs is the best one. There's another Music Brains. I think that's um, a British one. You're just, you're using databases out there. Um, so, like, I'll do a 78, look it up, and... Oh, I got a picture of the 78 now. Tell you something. Yes. I use Free Rip a lot for the old-time radio and old recordings that I put in there. And I'll put a CD in, you know, I'll do it the old school, transfer it to a CDRW, which the computer will love, and then it'll transfer it, but it will also think <laughs> it sees a title that exists already, and I'll have to cancel it someplace yeah. else. It'll see 29 minutes and 30 seconds for track one, 27.50 for track two, and it will think it knows these are two episodes of The Shadow. And I'll say, yeah, no, it's not. yeah. <laughs> I find you still have to so manually adjust it all. <laughs> but anyway, I want to quickly go on to the better stuff. Uh, so I'm just showing you, um, okay, maybe we'll clean this up a bit. So with this particular record, again, it's in good shape. Why is it not playing? Oh, there we go. Oh. So this record had a slight warp and a manufactured defect that made a little tick, tick, tick. Hear it? Yeah. This is the way the record starts with a heartbeat. This is the surface noise. So we'll go in and clean it up. So you might use a little bit more on it. Um, I still want the percussion protection. And might maybe give it, I'll just do two scans. We're going to scan the entire file. This record also had a few big pops in it. Now this is going to take longer because it's scanning both sides of an album. Do you want to say something while we're waiting? You're doing great. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Second that. This stuff, the stuff with the LPs, yeah, it's nice, whatever. You'll really see the benefit when we do 78s of cleaning up the sound. Hey, Mike? Yes? When you go to a database or whatever you call that, Looking up is the that stuff that people have put up, like just individuals have? It kind of reminds me of the old uh, Napster. Um, you're, you're not you taking their yeah, sound you files, either. you're taking a listing of the tracks on the album and a picture of the record. And where does that come from? Uh, Discogs, Music Brains, they're public sites. You mentioned something that was a 78 project. 
Oh yeah. I, if that's what I'm thinking of, it has like eight different versions of the same record. With four different styli and four different uh -huh. EQs or without oh, EQ, yeah. and you go nuts trying to decide which one you want. <laughs> yeah, but all I'm looking up handy. is just data about these are the songs on the record, and here's a picture of the record. So mm -hmm. as it scanned this two side LP, it found 13,678 potential pops and clicks. And it's going to show them as black dashes. So here's the beginning of it there, and there was a nasty one at the end, I remember. So, see this line here? That's a pop. So, let's play it. Oh, I turned the sound down. That's a knock. Mike? Yes? Oh. Are those left and right channels the two waveforms? Yes, left and right. I think, okay. I think the left is on top. Um, so, Let's listen to it without the corrections. So anytime you see these spikes, those are pops. So we'll play it without them. Oh, oh, I love this the best song. Here's a pop. And here's another one. Oh, it's just a needle drop. But let's listen to the correction that it's done. No pop. And um, so again, these black lines here is the beginning of the record. If you remember, we had a lot of surface noise. It's, a couple of them still got through, and we'll manually correct those. In fact, there's another way I can do it. These are pops. So some of them have gotten through. So what I can do is I'm going to highlight the area that needs more correction than the others. And I'm going to go, I'm going to just scan the selection. And here I stick it on maximum. And do it four times. This will be fast because it's just a tiny little section of the song. We found a, almost 1,500 clicks in just that little bit. So let's play it back. I thought this part was neat because you got a, a thumping heartbeat and you got pops and clicks. Oh, still got through. Yeah. But it's a lot better than it was. Yeah. yeah. There's another way I have of getting getting around. When I did this at home, I got rid of all of it. But I don't want to spend too much time on LPs because they're easy to fix. It's a 78s that this really works great on. So let's just move on to the next one. Um, okay, actually, here's here's an Eagle song, "Peaceful Easy Feeling," and it had a nasty pop in it. Sometimes, sometimes a program can't fix all the pops. So you can do it manually. So this is our pop here. So let's move it ahead. It's not too bad. It, I found when I scanned it here, it just go through it fast. Sometimes it knocks it down a bit, but you can still hear it. So I want to show you a manual click repair. So it's reduced it a lot here, but there's still when I still see some green there, I know I'm going to hear it. Okay, so we still have the pop there. It's not as loud. We can compare it to the way it was used to be. Okay. There's a neat feature here. You can play one second of it. Okay, so there it is. So what I could do is a manual click repair. I'm going to go over the pop which is here, it's a spike. And I'm going to flatten it out. So our green is the way the recording was, and the black is the correction. So that's the right channel. Now let's do the left channel. You see they're all wavy and whatever. And we'll play one second of it. It's corrected, it's gone. 
You know what? You still heard it because I didn't have the correction on. So let's play it now. So that click is repaired. That's a neat feature. I mean, I've had to use that. Um, 1,900. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's where you would just do the cleanup here and you just scan the whole file. But I've had some 78s that say have a needle dig on them. And actually, I can show you one. Um, it was amazing how it cleaned up. <coughs> Ukulele Ike is Cliff Edwards. It's a Cliff Edwards song. It's called When I Was a Son of a Bee. <laughs> so here's what a 78 looks like cleaned up. And this had a, these here are somebody dropping a tone arm on the record and really digging it. So let's listen to it before. I had a dream last evening. It meant so much to me. Clear needle dig, right? Your so I manually repaired the clicks. And we'll listen to the correction. Do you still hear a little bit of tiny thump? I mean, it's not 100% perfect, but it's a lot better. Last evening, it meant so much to me. How's that? Yeah. Quite the difference compared to the way it used to be. So that's when you would do a manual repair. It meant so much to me. Because we know as we get used records, who knows what's happened to them. It meant so much to me. And so we have to clean them up. So I'm just moving right along, trying to go as fast as possible because you know, I was going to say Brian wants to eat his donut, but he took off. <laughs> <laughs> um, he went for a donut. Yeah. So let's move on. I wanted to show you the difference between playing something with the proper equalization versus RIAA. So this is a Benny Goodman record from 1938, and this is a proper equalization. I haven't cut out much surface noise, but you'll notice it's brighter. And listen to the cymbals. 